Hello and welcome again to Cherry Red TV. I'm Ian McNay and my guest today is John Cray. Hi John. Hi there. And um, Safari Records had many interesting acts including Toya and the Boys and Wayne County and we're going to hear about the stories about Safari which ran from 1977 to 1985 and find out more about the motivation behind the label from from John himself. So you started Safari, you'd come out of a management situation and you started with two other partners. Yes, well we were a heavy metal business um, and uh, my, my long-term partner, he was my partner from 1977 through to his death in 2010, Tony Edwards, he was living in Paris as a tax exile and I was very friendly with Rolf Buda Music Verlag, a really old-fashioned music publishers in Berlin, owned by a guy called Rolf Buda. He died and left the business to his son Andy. Um, and the, the, the plan originally was to, to, to start a pan-European label with someone in Paris, someone in Berlin, someone in London. It was all sort of a bit well, utopian. Very, very ambitious. Yeah, and it was a bit utopian. So we started with really quite a middle-of-the-road act, the Chancer Sisters, who were two session singers, had great voices. Uh, the first album recorded in Nashville with Roger Cook producing. Um, but then um, it soon became clear that we couldn't work with Andy. He was a bit unstable, basically. Um, and uh, Tony came back to live in London. And uh, we Safari got going, really. Uh, with Wayne County. We we met um, Howard Devoto in our big flash heavy metal office in New Street. So was Street. he in the Buzzcocks or magazine? No, he was time? in the, he just, he came wandering in the office looking for an album deal and he had um, Spiral Scratch. Well that's his, the, right at the beginning of The very like beginning, Buzzcocks, yeah. yeah. And so he said, how many of those did you have you sold? And he sold like twenty five thousand from his front new, room. Through new home, that was through new hormones. Yeah. yeah, it was quite amazing. So yeah. we thought this this is a business. So we sort of looked into it. Meanwhile, you know, Deep Purple it cost three hundred thousand dollars to get Rainbow's light show across the Atlantic, and they were becoming unviable. Um, so uh, we were looking for a new business anyway, and uh, so we found basically the first one was Wayne County and we had a, quite a bit of success with Wayne really. But how did that come about because Wayne was American? No, he was working in England. He, it was uh, Wayne and uh, his boyfriend guitarist who was American, but then three Englishmen, the drummer and the bass player and the keyboard player were English um, and they were touring on that circuit. Right, and uh, he'd come out of the CBGB's. Yeah, um, Max's Kansas City was his real right, place. Right, yeah. Okay. And um, and then we had, um, so, you know, everybody was crazy about Fuck Off. I mean, that was, we released that as the first single. We were distributed by Pi, who wouldn't, did, uh, wouldn't distribute it. And uh, we just, we, j we basically sold it out of our little basement office in Manchester Street by the ton, basically. You know, all those funny little, um, companies like graduate records in wolverhampton they take like 200 and so on um, and it stayed in the lightning independent chart for a year that's number one quite amazing yeah so just just to explain a bigger back, better background then so once you signed him you decided you heard this track which was actually i think originally called if you don't want to fuck me, baby, fuck off. Yeah. Which is a fairly direct... <laughs> in brackets. <laughs> you couldn't do that these days. Could you? Uh, bring me to fuck off. And then, of course, you had distribution difficulties because certain yeah. people didn't yeah. want to handle it. Didn't get any airplay apart from, I think, in my notes I picked up somewhere, it got one play on Radio Hallam, I think it was. Yeah. No, it was the one... Trent, Radio, Radio Trent. Trent. A Radio guy right, called Radio Trent. Uh, uh, Bingham. Uh, he was doing the three o'clock in the morning slot and wanted to see if anybody was listening <laughs> and it was just him <laughs> did he get any complaints yeah he said just him and the security man in this little radio yeah. station in nottingham and apparently there were people beating on the door <laughs> really yeah <laughs> and not wanting to get a copy yeah. either and uh, you know we got press all over the world i mean i can remember 
we, we got sort of front page headlines of a newspaper in Switzerland that someone had played it in Switzerland, not knowing what it, they were singing about, I suppose, yeah. and uh, the public. So it was, it was, you know, innovative for this time. <laughs> yeah, but also you see Wayne, as he was then, because he changed to Jane later, yeah. was incredibly influential. And again, I think this is actually on your website or I put it off somewhere else that Patty Smith talks about him yeah. uh, in her autobiography as um, saying that Wayne Stroke Jane was her biggest influence. Yeah. And Bowie again was uh, as quoted him in Cherry, Cherry Vanilla too. So yeah, well, Wayne ended up in Berlin when Andy was still part of the business, having sort of the first part of his sex change operation. And of course, Berlin was the place. You know, Bowie was up there. Um, all the lust for life and all that sort of thing was going on in Berlin. Um, Berlin was a great place to be in those days. Before the war came down, there was a tax advantage to young people to live in Berlin and you didn't have to do national service. So it was like a madhouse, Berlin. There was, yes. Everybody was young and out at the clubs. Great place to be. What, what, what was Wayne like in terms um, of... Incredibly polite and incredibly masculine in some ways. So, yes. for instance, if my wife walked into the room, he'd stand up. You know, and that's and, and, lovely, isn't it? And, and he was uh, he was a, a southern gentleman. You know, he yes. came from Georgia, so um, he he was lovely, and uh, he we we all got on with him very well. I mean, a bit kind of eccentric, as he because he wasn't just he didn't ch just change sex. You know, he was just in this mad new wave thing that you know I didn't really understand half of what was going on, but um, lovely, great guy. So when he told you. That he was going to change sex. What was your reaction? Uh, it was constantly being talked about from the very first time we met him. Okay. So he so never he never talked himself about himself being a homosexual. He always talked about you know before I'd ever heard the words. Now it's in everybody's lips. But he said I'm a transsexual. Right. So he was really way way ahead of yeah. his time. Yeah. And that was unusual at the time. Yeah. And did you feel his character changed afterwards, or she's her character was different uh, from, from him? the very beginning? He was taking hormones, so I think he was always, always at the beginning, he was he was feminine. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so that came out actually on a sub label, Sweet FA Records. So it was under the Safari umbrella. But on Sweet. thanks for reminding me. <laughs> <laughs> And the other thing we should mention is there was quite a well-known piano player on the... Uh, yeah, Jules Holland. Jules Holland played on that. And do you know something? I'd, I'd forgotten that. And um, Jules Holland got the, the MITS Awards uh, four or five years ago. And they rang up from the BPI because everybody that gets that award is allowed a double album of their favourite tracks. Yeah. And they rang up and said, we want to use Fuck Off. And I went, really? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I didn't realise it was his piano player playing at the beginning of the record. Well, apparently the story is, I don't know how true all this is, that he played on there, but when he played it was just an instrumental. Yeah. And he was told it needed a boogie-woogie feel. And then the, when he got the record, finally, he actually played it to his family because he didn't know what the lyrics were. So it was all a bit of a shock when he found out what was really on there. On the other hand... I suppose he was proud because it was one of the first times he'd played on record. Yeah. So, and how does that actually sell that record? Well, usual sort of 50,000 or something. Sorry, record what? singles used to sell hundreds, thousands, you know, those days. Well, you know, Trey Red also started at the same time as Safari pretty much. And it was very much, if you had a single which was semi-decent, it had a nice cover. The distribution sites around the world was you could all, you could sell a few thousand of almost anything. Yeah, and then of course. Well, it was almost so the opposite though. It had to be really grungy the sleeve, you know. I mean, I think the the fuck off was a was a toilet wall <laughs> with all the graffiti on yes. it. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and um, so you had trouble with the distribution, but then you switched to Spartan distribution. No, we we were with um, we we with Pi. And they wouldn't release Fuck Off, but then we put the first Wayne County album out um, and we got a hit with um, Eddie and Sheena. Um, we were so surprised. I mean, it went in the charts at 50 or something. 
and we couldn't get any stock. We had no clout with the printers, no clout with the pressing plant, and we yeah. just lost it. You know, a year or two later, we'd learned how to <coughs> how to cope with that, but uh, we had no clout with the printers, and so it just disappeared. It had to keep we had to keep it in a picture sleeve. And one of the challenges of any independent label was to keep everything going, wasn't it? Oh, it was a madhouse. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, I can remember being so desperate um, pressing records at Linguaphone. Which was the, the the classical? No, no, it's um, the the um, that's how you learn the foreign language. Do you oh, remember right. you used to buy those records and oh, you used right. to you used to listen in French and something? They used to, you could get like a thousand a day out of them, and I was like desperate for, for any stock. You know, I mean, in the toyer days, we'd have orders for over fifty thousand a day, and yes. you know that's a lot of hustling. Yes. And Friday we always went to the pub because we come if we had a hit we were completely exhausted by hustling for stock, just and yeah. you didn't have to worry on Friday because if you didn't have any stock on Friday then the game was up anyway. <laughs> so your next significant signing on Safari was the Boys. Yes. And they'd already had I think been on Nems before that. Was yeah, that right? immediate records. Immediate, yes. Yeah. Um, and had some success. Brickfield Nights was a bit of a hit for them. I yes. Think. So when you signed them, was there was a competition or was that something that, that were they clear they wanted to come to you? Their, their keyboard player, who, whose name was Casino Steel, I can't remember his real name, um, he was Norwegian. And he got everybody out to Norway and they found this rich bloke who pulled up the money to do an album uh, in hell. I mean, there's a place in Norway called Hell, yes, and they yeah. recorded it in Hell, um, and the album was called To Hell With The Boys, and we bought it off this Norwegian chap, this financier. Um, so it was already made, we heard the album. Um, the, the boys were really, really um, looked after by their publisher, Malcolm Forrester, you probably know. I know Malcolm um, very well. Yeah. He, he was very kind to them, and was, yeah. was, was always a great help to them. Yeah. And of course, Casino was in a band called the Hollywood Brats. Yeah. Andrew Matheson was a singer who were probably, I, I remember when I first saw them, must have been about 76, you know, they, were, they weren't punk in appearance, but they were certainly punk musically before anyone else, anyone else was really doing yeah. it. They were well ahead of their time. And the boys, for me, always had this really, they had a strong sound. They were good musicians. They were good musicians. They worked hard. Um, and I think they still gig, don't they? There's still this band still still gig yeah and you also did um, a Christmas record with the boys oh the Yobs and the name of the Yobs which of course is Boys Backwards which you recorded very quickly didn't you we did it in a day yeah in a little studio in um, in Soho um, and it was just the, the whole thing about the Yobs was it was there was no sort of quality attached to the Yobs um, so. Uh, they actually had my my dog Humphrey, the, the singing spaniel, on it. He, if you told him to sing, he'd throw his head back and howl, while the boys were singing Silent Night. And so that's on the record, and um, and the the black tape op in the studio, they they made him sing White Christmas. <laughs> so it was, and it, and of course the jobs always had um, Hitler somewhere on the sleeve. Um, so they did the carol the drum, rubber dum dum, and it was right. Hitler with a dummy in his mouth. Right. You know, yeah. there was always Hitler on it somewhere. Right. So at that point, you were doing fairly well. Your business was ticking over okay, but you hadn't had a really hit as such, not no. a real hit. And then you you heard about Toya. So just just talk talk us well, through. Uh, there, there, were to there was one article of her very first gig, um, uh, and we read it in the office. Tony was always went through the papers like with a fine tooth comb, and he found this article about Toya, and she got this warehouse somewhere in Waterloo called Mayhem, and it was kind of like an art centre. That's so where she lived. She that, lived. Yeah. She lived in kind of a packing case shed inside this warehouse and there are other people who had these sort of lockups within the, the warehouse um, and she's very short so it was only about five foot tall inside and I used to be bent double when I went inside it was on two floors believe it or not and she did a gig there um, and we signed her I mean she just had such charisma it wasn't true her band were terrible 
and they did just the one album and then it all broke up and the um, you know she replaced them with, with actually with session players that were sort of they weren't part of the band just her and Joel the guitarist um, and uh, she had an enormous following um, but she was also an actress which gave her a big advantage um, she'd actually worked at the National although I think she did get thrown out for being unruly but um, uh, when, when uh, the, her manager was approached to, um, to to find a band and a gig for shoestring you remember the detective yeah I do I used to enjoy on, that yeah. it's on ITV I think and so uh, Howard her manager p- found a, a pub gig and Toya played it and then there was this this thing about one of the one of the band was supposed to be a murder or something anyway it gave her this cult following so we were selling loads of records and not getting in the charts and we did two albums with no chart position and literally selling you know hundreds of records and the charts were such a carve up in those days we never got anywhere with it yeah well you put her with Nick Torber the producer didn't yeah. you which is quite a smart move because he he'd Work with some quite high profile people. Yes, Marillion. He was, he did Marillion and a few other things. Yes. Um, and uh, yeah, and, 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 and Toya needed um, a lot of direction. Um, you know, she needed help with her songwriting to sort of get the structure together and he helped, helped her a great deal. Yeah. But in fact, her first hit she didn't write. It's a Mystery was written by a chap called Keith Hale, who produced one of her first albums. Um, and that was the first hit and we thought it was a really commercial record we were getting a bit away a bit further away from punk and getting a bit more into mainstream pop with that Um, so we decided we looked around to see how you got in the charts and you got in the charts by using strike force which we did and strike force was a promotion company that was working in the chart return shops yeah Um, weirdly i mean it seems ridiculous these days but only the independent record shops reported back to the charts so HMV, Virgin, Our Price, all those shops, Woolworths, Boots, you sell probably 90% of the records they didn't report to the chart shops just what the Americans call mum and pops um, so they were the only ones returning to the charts and had to fill these ridiculous diaries in about how many records they sold yes. and it was just open to graft and you know so um, these people went round, gave away free stock to the chart shops. Put, put, I think some of them even filled the diaries in. You know, so lo and behold, we came in first week at about 26, I think, with with It's a Mystery, which was basically a four-track EP that went 33 and third rather than 45. So it was always being played at the wrong speed on radio. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was called Four from Toya, and uh, it got to four in the charts. Yeah. And it, it sold what getting on for half a million. Looking back, that's incredible, isn't it? Half a million records. Yeah. Well, even Toya, who God bless her, is inclined to exaggerate, underestimated how many se- we sold in a day in her biography. I actually wrote to her and said, "We sold far more than ten thousand a day, Toya." Yeah. <laughs> and how was she to work with? Was she she to- was brilliant. She was. Yeah. She knew where she what she wanted to do and how she wanted to present herself and all those costumes and the hair and you know was she was just fantastic it was it wasn't us it was her absolutely we just supplied the money and i mean some of those costumes and i mean this we we were putting sets on stage that um you know like modern day sets but at the time i mean bands just used to go on with a back line and that was it you know but we put sort of pyramids on stage and you know yeah so uh, hang on the lights just gone again okay so the secret if you like with her was her determination her creativity Sorry, can, you, can you start that question again please so the secret of her yeah so are you making a note of timing okay. yeah thanks so the secret with Toya of her success was her determination her drive, her ideas and creativity. Yes. Um, yeah. She was, she was actually brilliant. And she still is. I mean, you know, she, I saw her the other week and, uh, you know, she's, she's had a great career. Yeah. And 
But didn't she knock you out once and break two of your, li- your ribs? Uh, well, there was a fight <laughs> at a gig. So you were and I was more worried about her being beaten up than me. And somehow I got, I got a, a broken rib and, you know, got... I was quite a strong, big, rugby-playing boy in those days. But, and she's about four foot ten, if that, so... But she had, she got into a fight with somebody else at a gig. So and she I, started a fight. Didn't oh she? yeah, she just weighed in. She'd jump off the stage and punch somebody. She was. <laughs> but <laughs> that's gone into sort of history, so no one really knows. <laughs> well, it's in her auto, it's in her autobiography. Yeah, yeah. That she knocked you out and gave you two broken ribs. Yeah. And did and was that sort of feisty side evident when she used to come in the office? No, not really. No, I mean. There was nothing like that. It was all done through the managers, really. Yeah. No, she was, you know, it was always friendly and the managers sorted out the nasty bits. I'm just looking here. Of course, Nick Tauber had my notes here. He he previously had produced Thin Lizzy, Slaughter and the Dogs, Cock Sparrow Girls. So he'd had good experience. Yes. And varied acts, because you got, you got rock, punk, Oi, and uh, sort of power, almost power pop there. So. Yeah, and also he um, he worked closely with, a, with an engineer called Phil Harding that went on to to, uh, um, to work with Pete Waterman and all those hits with Pete Waterman. So he did. Yeah. He was a great engineer too. So it was a great team, and we we kind of lived in um, Marquee Studios behind the Marquee. Um, so the Ship Pub was us on a regular basis. Yeah, and, and, and with Toya, was it she would come up with the releases or did you, was there any No, a lot of the creative ideas behind um, the, the tracks was from Joel, her guitarist. So he got kind of the music together and she got the lyrics together. Um, so I remember Anthem, which became um, Thunder in the Mountains. You know, they came in with the track. It was a fantastic track. We waited forever for Toya to write the lyrics. So. Yeah. yeah. But um, when we did an album, it was she was kind of it was the usual thing. You know, finish touring, write some songs. You know, let's do an album. Let's tour again. It was kind of like that. Yeah. So what's the reason she left? Because she left, didn't she, and signed to was it CBS? She signed. Yeah, she to? signed to CBS. Yeah. Her manager wanted the power of a big record company. Yeah. We never got release. We never got a release in America. We got to a, a, a situation where we were three albums into a five-year deal, um, and she had to produce one album a year. So um, you go to America, and you want to do a five-album deal. They want five albums, and we only had three. So then you go back to the manager, and you say, "Well, you know, America want the sign." And so you, you get kind of into a catch-22 situation where they want out to get the mega buck of France. You don't want to give up your last three albums. And it never materialised. It was a great shame. Yeah, because you had the big hits. Yes. After she left you, not much happened really. In yeah, terms well, of um, her manager decided that they should uh, use a different producer for the last album she did with us, Rebel Run. Um, and uh, no, it wasn't. No, this, this, the fourth album they changed producers for um, the Changeling, and uh, I can't remember who, the, who we, they chose for the producer. But he didn't have the patience and the, and the kind of wherewithal that Nick Talbot had with her, and it was a great shame because I think her career would have probably done a bit better had had, the, had she not changed producers at that time. Okay, so. Um after Toya left, who were your kind of big hopes after that? Because uh, I, I know this happened to so many businesses. They had, they had real success, sold a lot of records, had that high turnover, and then you, you build the, the structure up, the staffing structure up to, to support yeah, that. Yeah, we, we always kept our overheads to a minimum and always used okay. freelancers. So freelance plugger, freelance PR, and all that. So yeah. it was just, just me, Tony, and a and a secretary that's we ran it like that all the way through so you were just three people yeah. on the payroll and the rest yeah. was, was we really used alan james as a plugger who was yeah. a great plugger um 
Judy Totten did all the PR, yeah, PR right, for yeah, us, you know. Yeah. So they were great people. And of course, when the artists finish, you, you don't have any, you don't have to pay them off or anything. So then we signed those French girls, which we didn't have any success with, and um, English Evening, so who I thought were particularly talented. And then I went on to uh, do all the all the music for the Torval and Dean tour. So when they became when they became professional. They couldn't dance to records anymore. The musicians' union wouldn't let them. Right. And we, I had to copy all that music for them. So I was kind of busy doing things. Um, and then we, we changed completely changed track of what we did. Yeah. So towards the end, you, you, um, you went more into the world of soundtrack. And yeah. Then, yeah. Yes. It wasn't on Safari. Um, and so I'm just looking at the the other releases, and there's a lot of a lot of kind of interesting names there you did an album with glenn hughes yeah was that was pretty early days yeah that was the leftover from the deep purple days yeah. uh, uh, we also had singing dog records of course which we were quite proud of um, so tell me about singing, singing dog, dog records once again we read an article about a canadian group called mclean and mclean and they had a hit record in canada with a song called dolly parton's tits yes off an album called taking the o out of country and we thought we we signed them without ever hearing it. I mean, we we were we were always full of fun. We just used to like to laugh and do crazy things. And I think that kind of uh, that whole thing was like an independent. It was being irreverent, you know. Um, so we signed we signed them, and uh, we actually brought them over and got them on television. Um, they, there was a program called Over the Top, and we brought them over and they played on that. Did a few gigs record didn't get anywhere particularly but it was on singing dog records and the the label was was a rip-off of the hm fee label it was it was my again my dog humphrey the spaniel kicking the gramophone and singing into a microphone right and hmv thought it was a we were pinching their their logo and humphrey got into correspondence with the legal department of emi um and until um, it got quite heavy and we tony and i thought hmm we might be in trouble here and Humphrey deceased, deceased from writing any more letters to the, to the legal department of HMV. <laughs> we did quite a few crazy things, you know. <laughs> yeah, and you... We actually had a performing dog that took the records around to the radio and to the, to the trade papers that used right. to run into the office and put the, the record on someone's desk and come out again. <laughs> Singing dog records. And then you had you had some releases by uh, or a release by Purple Hearts. Yes, who, who um, Ray Fennick was living in Hastings, and there was this whole uh, South Downs of Purple Hearts and the Team Beats and things like that. So we did a whole album of that's right, um, Uppers, Uppers on the South yeah, Downs. Yeah, that was my idea. Great title, yeah, and yeah. Uppers on the South Downs. Yeah, <laughs> I'm proud of that. Because <laughs> there was that was that whole mud scene was quite yeah. prolific at that time, and there was a few shops along Hastings and Brighton and places like that that really all the mods used to gather with their bikes and everything. Yeah. And then Gary Holton did a version of Ruby. Tim Gary Holton that came from Norway again. That was um, uh, with, with Cass set that up. Um, and he sang that to "Don't Take Your Love, Don't Take Your Gun to Town" thing. Um, it was. Uh, quite funny and of course then he popped up on Ophidus and Pep but we gave the record back it was the we just had the UK rights and Norwegian had it in Norway okay okay and he did a couple of albums with those two Casino Steel and uh, Holton Gary yes. Holton yes yes so overall what's the feeling you're left with with Safari Records in terms of you had you had huge success with Toya you you know you, you did interesting things because Toyo became a kind of icon in one way, um, and the boys were a, a good seminal band, and then you had Wayne Stroke Jane, so yes. they're, they're all very different in their own way. Yeah, and we're still in touch with them, and no one hates us too much, I don't think. Um, and it was seven years of great fun. Yes, um, I enjoyed it immensely. Tony enjoyed it immensely. Um, the biggest thing we did, of course, was we discovered Johnny Clegg and Jaluka from South Africa. That was that was an unbelievable sequence of events where I was really into signing an African band. This guy came along, Scatterlings of Africa. Um, 
we got uh, we, we applied for a work permit thinking we'll never get a work permit for a South African band with the, with the cultural boycott Mrs Thatcher's Britain and they said yes and we got got them into the UK uh, we got some TVs that were all blacked by the by the, the, the cameramen and so on and the staff at the TV companies. Mrs. Thatcher intervened, forced them to take, brought them back again, forced them to put them on the TV. I was on the World at One Radio 4 where my biggest aspirations was to be on Radio 1. I was like serious, seriously being interviewed about apartheid and stuff. Right. Um, and you know, Johnny went on to get an OBE for work for apartheid, but the Musicians Union wouldn't let him in the country. Um, but that was quite, that was probably the most interesting thing I've ever done in my life. Right. And that was the genesis of Graceland's. You know, it was Johnny's band and his mates that provided all those Zulu musicians that were on Graceland's. Right, that's quite something. So yeah. it was, and you know, and um, Cat Stevens, Youssef, whatever his name is, um, he wouldn't sing for a long while but he always wanted to do these peace rallies. So he'd always ask Johnny to sing Peace Train because he couldn't sing because he, he's yes. a Muslim or something. Yeah. And they remained friends until Johnny's death last year. Yeah. Okay, well, we've covered Safari Records pretty well, I think. So um, thank you, John. Thank you, I enjoyed talking to you. And thank you for watching Trayway TV. <laughs>